Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening for those who are joining us uh, from far away. Um, my special thanks to the um, the panelists here, uh, the esteemed panelists. Uh, we have a few folks from uh, from India, but also from Singapore and Malaysia. So to my Singapore Malaysia friends, uh, good afternoon. Um, our topic uh, is uh, really about innovation and transformation during this. Uh, pandemic time and how digitalization has helped to, to not only sustain through the uh, through the pandemic period, but how that is going to be sustained uh, as a longer journey. So we'll have a set of questions that we want to talk about uh, uh, related to the experiences that each of the panelists have had. They come from a variety of backgrounds, as you've seen from the introductions, uh, some on the corporate banking side, the trade, insurance, uh, retail payments, so a, a rich of experience across the uh, the, the members. Um, I look at when I look at uh, other sectors. Clearly, uh, digitalization uh, has uh, taken off quite dramatically. We see that in uh, especially in retail settings. As a priority sector, we uh, um, are seeing a much more um, uh, availability of banks and financial institutions uh, in the marketplace. So has innovation really taken place during this time is one question. So maybe I'll kick it off and ask that question to Rishi first. Uh, Rishi, you're, you're at the cusp of retail payments uh, and SME payments. Um, is, uh, is digitalization, is the uh, sector uh, progressing really well during this time? Has it taken off? Uh, has innovation taken off? Yeah, thank you, Shridhar, and uh, good morning to everyone and good afternoon. See, uh, during the pandemic and before that also, especially if you look at the India context, uh, the digitization on the payment ecosystem had already started with UPI, which started three years back. And before that also, there was enough innovation coming out of the India stack as well as from the NPCI stack. So looking at this pandemic situation, we would say that a lot of execution work has happened on innovation, which was already there. So uh, it's more like uh, adoption of the technologies and digital programs which were running in the country and further getting accelerated during this period. I will share with you some of the examples. The government of India released nearly 30,000 crore rupees uh, for the, uh, the low income category and the people who are holding the government PMJDY accounts. That money got dispersed through multiple channels outside the bank branches and ATMs through merchants and through the Aadhaar enabled payment systems. So the APA system, which was running on biometric, was already there and it further got accelerated during this program. Further, we are seeing that because of the contactless nature of business, which is there, a lot of innovation is happening on IRIS, uh, which is another tool in which uh, you can actually disperse and do transactions. Facial recognition is another tool which is coming up and may, may get uh, traction in the next couple of years, where apart from biometric, you would see facial recognition as well as Iris becoming one of the leaders in, for, in terms of uh, the contactless payments. If you look at the digitization journey of the urban customers, uh, you would see the data from the UPI uh, stack in terms of the value of the transactions, both in terms of the amounts as well as in the volume has gone up dramatically. It has uh, gone, exceeded the pre-COVID numbers as well. And we are seeing on a month-to-month -month basis, there's a growth of about 10 to 15% on the UPI stack itself. So both in terms of digitization and innovation on multiple tools has happened during pandemic. And I think the customer adoption has also been quite well. In our own business, we are seeing that the, there's a change in the consumer behavior of going to branches and ATMs to coming to a local point to do transactions at, at variety of time. It doesn't need to go at a particular branch timings. So those fulfillments have emerged because of the technology, the digitization and innovation which happened over the last couple of years and which is getting further uh, executed and executed well on the ground. Thank you, Rishi. Uh, Rajati, uh, you, you have a very different marketplace and a different customer base. Uh, are you seeing the same innovation? I know you have typically had a, a high 
uh, check paying, uh, traditional payments type of customer base. But during this pandemic, uh, has innovation crept into to your marketplace and, and how have you been able to leverage that to your advantage? Uh, hi, Sri, and uh, good afternoon from Kuala Lumpur. Well, Malaysia went into a lockdown on March 18, and it was a full national lockdown. We weren't even allowed to leave our homes. So there was a, there was a massive, intense drive to migrate those who were reluctant to migrate, particularly the smaller micro SMEs who were hanging on to their check paying ways and hadn't um, used any of our cash management systems. So it was during that 47 days when we were in total lockdown, where we couldn't even see our clients to facilitate uh, onboarding. Um, following that, when there was a lift and we're now in what we call a conditional uh, restrictive uh, restricted movement order, that we've seen a, a number of our clients uh, now migrating and moving on to um, the use of our cash management systems. So it has been, for us, there was two things. If I, if I can just take one step back, it was also organizational in the bank itself. Because, you know, mm -hmm. when, when they announced the lockdown, the first thing we had to do was to enable everybody to work from home. And to automatically do that over a weekend, over 10,000 people was quite a feat. We, I mean, we had BCPs. I'm sure you guys have that too. But never in the scale, right? Like suddenly everyone's got to work from home. So we had to enable our people first and then get our clients to be enabled as well. And doing that remotely was very difficult. We also, um, there's a huge drive towards digitization in this country. Even our central bank has actually been pushing for this. But on the retail side, we've not, unfortunately the rules still require face-to-face -face KYC onboarding. So whilst we have te technologies available, but regulatory wise, we've not been able to do that remotely for the, the smaller guys, the, the individuals, the micro SMEs. So that has been a challenge and is still a challenge today. And what, what has come out of this is then conversations have taken a different turn with our regulators as well to push, um, allowing us to do totally 100% you know, remote KYC. Fantastic, so, so the progress is being made uh, on, uh, on your end. But also we see um, we see uh, a lot of progress on um, on Rishi side on the payment side with uh, iris based type of payment capabilities, which is amazing to hear. Um, and then on the other side, you hear about check writing still being 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 a fashion, right? Um, uh, maybe turn a little bit to the insurance side. Um, and Rishi, you are representing the the insurance side of the business. Um, you know, a unique situation where you know, during lockdown, people are not driving. Uh, the uh, the need for insurance uh, comes down quite dramatically, although health insurance uh, requirements have increased uh, um, proportionally uh, to, due to the pandemic. What have you seen from your customer base um, the as far as digitization? And, and have you used it towards the renewal side of your business? Are you using it more towards the internal processes uh, um, uh, as a capability? Well, uh, Sri, uh, it's been now 246 days, I think, since since lockdown was imposed in India. And now we are in an unreal world of lockdown there, not there. So uh, the overall context is as follows. Uh, India happens to be the largest market for life insurance uh, on the planet in terms of number of policies. But number 10 in terms of uh, premium collected. So we still have 18% of the world's population, but only 2.5% of the world's premiums. The big mega trends uh, that we see, uh, which has resulted on account of COVID, is uh, to my mind three. One is this deep fear of loss of health, like you rightly said, and even loss of life. In fact, uh, Google searches gives us a very good uh, um, very good estimation of this fear. Uh, we saw a huge spike, uh, nearly a 90% year-on-year increase in Google searches for health insurance and term insurance and even life insurance to a lesser extent. But health and term really took the cake. And this search for protection uh, is very interesting because while India was spiking, rest 
sector of Asia, including uh, Rajati, Malaysia, was actually going down. There was a degrowth. So it only tells me that Indians probably love their families more or are more fearful of uh, what could happen to their health and life. And they were rushing. And we had a flood of protection policies. Mm. So, uh, so that was uh, very interesting. So uh, for the first six months from April till September of this financial year, we noticed that uh, the private sector, which is about half the premiums uh, in the country, the private sector in life insurance showed a minus 11% growth, but some assured the protection company, the sum assured has actually gone up by 16%. And company like ours, uh, uh, Touchwood, we've been fortunate. Uh, we've seen a premium growth of 9%, but even a sum assured growth of 40%, which I have not witnessed in the last decade uh, in this company. The second big trend is this fear of loss of financial capital and investment returns. So there's been a doubling of the, uh, of the demand for fully guaranteed products, long-term guaranteed products. And the third big uh, uh, mega trend is really the adoption of technology by all stakeholders, customers, agents, and employees. So customers, we've just flooded all our, all our ideas of uh, do-it-yourself tools, your retirement calculators, your real value, sum assured calculators, chatbots, webinar participations have all gone multifold. I think India just uh, leaped forth maybe five, seven years down the line. Agents, now we have started digital recruitment. It's a new muscle which we never had before. So uh, we always thought that recruiting for a variable agency requires this face-to-face -face meeting, cajoling, contact, training, onboarding, motivation in person. And for which we have built 322 offices, brick and mortar offices across the country. But when they were all shut down, we realized that actually we've been able to grow our year-on-year -year agent recruitment through digital means and digital webinars and tap into new segments which were not available before. Training has moved to learning on demand instead of being in a classroom. And similarly, our employees have now, uh, many of them, at least in support functions, have moved to work from home. So we have questioned, what are we doing with many of these branches and large floors that we have? In fact, uh, only, uh, only a week ago, we have taken a decision to give up one floor because we really don't need that space anymore, even in the long term. And it's only, it's only interesting, just before COVID, we refurbished all our offices. <laughs> so uh, summary, summary is uh, focusing on providing protection and guarantees and all round digitalization, which has improved effectiveness as well as efficiency. And so margin profiles of life insurers have actually increased during such time. But in our business, uh, very similar to banking, when you increase your margins, your returns go up, but your risk also goes up. So managing mortality and investment risk has come to the fore. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Vishy. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm laughing because when you talked about refurbishing uh, the brand new floor, I'm sitting in a brand new office and I think I'm employee number five who's actually sat in this uh, in this premises. So uh, I, I understand the, uh, the, the the dilemma and and uh, why even refurbished space can be given up. Uh, maybe turn a little bit to, to uh, Shiv Kumar. Shiv. Um, you deal with very large client base in the region. Uh, you're out of Singapore. Uh, I'd be curious to understand what your customers are doing because they often are at the cusp of wanting to innovate and, and push for or demand uh, for uh, greater accessibility, uh, different types of uh, um, uh, technologies, et cetera. What's happening in your customer base and how have they been uh, pushing innovation? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Sridhar. And it's, I think not, it's not too different from, from what other panelists have spoken, but it's slightly different context in the sense that, you know, unlike, unlike what uh, Rishi and Vishi have mentioned, we deal in, at least in the Asia Pacific context, part of the Singapore office, largely with uh, large corporates and financial institutions. We don't do retail banking in this part of the world, even though our parent company in the UK uh, does, it's a, it's a big retail banking engine. So I can draw some some retail experiences from the Western world as well later in, later in the panel. But from the Singapore context, you're right. We predominantly deal with large multinational or asia pac corporates and financial institutions. So for them, the challenges have been slightly different. Unlike, unlike retail clients, their need to physically visit branches anyway is lower. That even historically, large multinational corporates and financial institutions, when they do corporate banking or wholesale banking or investment banking, their need to visit branches is not as intense as for retail customers. So a lot of their payment 
files or letters of credit applications were anyway having online. But those trends have accelerated. I mean, the first thing we saw the minute Singapore went into lockdown in early April, and in fact, some multinational companies started doing split teams and work from homes a couple of weeks before the government imposed uh, lockdowns, is this uh, quick move to digital signatures and, and uh, digital authentication. So in some cases where they would have a courier boy do the runs of transporting, bills of lading, insurance certificates, or uh, physical copies of security documents back and forth between the bank office and their back office, um, they quickly wanted approvals to send uh, digital e-enabled uh, security documentation. I think that was the first innovation we saw. And, and I think that is where even internally, it was like a refreshing, uh, like, like a breath of fresh air that usually internal approvals for such risk acceptances or change in procedures in the, in the pre-COVID would have taken a few weeks. But given the circumstances we were in, a lot of processes internally also changed and adapted to react very quickly to, to these demands. So online um, uh, exchange of documents, which earlier the mindset was that these things can only be done uh, physically, that has changed uh, very drastically. And the other, other big complication was just like us, even the clients were working from home. When I say clients in our context, these are large corporates. So if the authorized signatory is working, two authorized signatories need to sign something. One is working remotely from one part of Singapore. One is working remotely from the from his home in another part of Singapore. You know, the old uh, process that we're all used to, you know, somebody signs a document, it goes to the next cabin and the other signatory signs. All those things are not possible where, where big sums of money is in excess of millions sometimes need two authorizers or two signatories. Uh, to quickly adopt to online digital uh, verification of signatures, um, that was that was I think the first move. And the second thing, also from a risk management perspective, their priorities suddenly changed. So if you are a large multinational corporate operate, operating in ten different countries across Asia Pacific, and they are our client, for them immediately they had suddenly to deal with a circumstance where different employees and different suppliers or different factories in different countries were going through a different phase. You know, their factory in India was operating, but their factory in China had been shut down because of COVID, because China was ahead uh, a few months. But their factories in Europe were still operating because Europe came into the COVID situation two months after Asia. So they had to deal with um, these emergencies of suddenly shifting supply chains, shifting sourcing from one factory, which has been in a country with lockdown, to try to see how much of the procurement they can shift from another supplier in a different country, which has not yet gone into lockdown. And as bankers, we had to quickly adopt uh, in terms of making sure that they are able to place orders, make payments to a different supplier than what they were used to, or they are selling to a different market or why a different market because ports had shut down. Customs officers were working from home. So importers and exporters couldn't clear their goods. Um, so in, in some cases, our risk tolerance buffers had to be increased on an emergency basis to make sure that our customers' day-to-day -day operations of customs clearance, imports, factory productions are not halted. Um, and I think most banks had to quickly respond. And that is where I think I was on a, on a different uh, uh, panel two days back and a couple of CEOs of European banks. And there was this interesting anecdote where one of them mentioned, if all the banks in the world had six months notice that COVID is going to happen and the world will go into a lockdown, start preparing for it. They would have set up steering committees and project committees and paid some consultants and had monthly steering calls and, and gone through a very bureaucratic process. And I think the same decisions we ended up taking in, in 24 hours or 48 hours because we didn't have that head, head, uh, you know, that, that, uh, head notice. And when forced to make decisions without too much increase in risk, uh, most large global and sometimes bureaucratic organizations were forced to respond very quickly. Uh, and that was, I think, an interesting lesson. And, and we are doing a lot of uh, internal focus now on how we can retain some of the lessons learned and some of that DNA of decision making and not lose that in the post-COVID world. Yes, we've, we've heard uh, anecdotes of how what used to take us months to decide, if not years to decide, we've decided in hours yeah. and, and days. So that, that uh, seems to resonate. 
Uh, Rajati, is that similar for you in, in AmBank as well? And um, following up to that uh, question, um, you, you have a career of working with fintechs uh, across um, um, uh, the Malaysia portfolio. Can you talk a little bit about some of the fintechs that you've been able to collaborate with and how third-party um, technologies have uh, enabled you to expedite during this, uh, uh, this tough times to be able to service your customers? Rajati? Okay. Following from what Shiv said, you know, we, we're all, um, I, I don't know any bank that is not bureaucratic. So what had happened was, in addition to working with fintech, I wanted to say that I'm also positioning ourselves like we, to behave like a fintech ourselves. The, the follow-up from the pandemic was to look at our larger clients, so our large corporate clients, who are facing retail customers. And they found that they were having challenge, challenges in dealing with their retail customers. So what we did, and we are the first and still the only bank that decided to expose our APIs, the only one that's uh, practicing open banking now. And, and, and to what Shiv said, Shiv, I've been trying to pitch for this, you know, to expose my APIs to clients. And I just had to go through a million and one committees, right? But here, my clients were, were stuck. And to help them, that was what I did. We exposed our APIs for our clients to facilitate their client onboarding. So we did that for Rakuten. And the Rakuten is a Japanese uh, stock working trading company. So they couldn't do any onboarding during, during the uh, lockdown. So we exposed our APIs. Recently, just two weeks ago, uh, a really good kudos to my team was that we, all, we, we started the country's first payment APIs. All that was only made possible because of the situation we're in. And following also the conversation with working with fintechs, you know how big banks are generally very suspicious of these fintechs, very uncomfortable, and that we, we go through pilots and sandboxes. I mean, in Malaysia, the sandboxes take two years before we can really take that on to the next level. But we don't have time for sandboxes now. We have no time to play in the sand. Um, and so the fintechs that we've been working with, we've been piloting stuff, and now we're like on, okay, let's just go into third gear. We gotta go. Um, so we've been, what we've done is uh, currently we're working with with a local Malaysian fintech that, that have been doing supply chain financing, and um, and they have, and the whole setup was AI and machine learning, very different from how we do our supply chain financing. You know, we have a the big old dinosaur kind of machine. So, and um, we were still, our clients, our smaller clients, not the large corporate, but the smaller clients were still doing physical invoice presentment. So how was that even possible during the pandemic, during the lockdown? And, and we were also having office boys coming around, you know, signing contracts. So what we started doing is to, we work with some of our larger clients to experiment the, the use of smart contracts on say uh, guarantees, bills. So things that, and we had actually initiated this conversation with our clients before, but you know, they said, okay, but no one was um, pushed to a corner to really do this. So now we've got, you know, a very huge, almost monopolistic uh, utility company in Malaysia that's like, okay, okay, let's do this now because we just cannot have this um, bank guarantee presented physically. We can no longer afford for, for this you know, invoice presentment. Um, and I, I'm afraid I can't mention the, the FinTech names that we're working with, but currently what I'm glad to say is that at least from the bank, you know, people who, the decision makers are now open to working with these banks. And my regulators are also open to working with these FinTechs. So the thing is, my regulators are also concerned when you work with fintechs, where do the data lie? You know, is there a breach in data? Do you compromise? Does it sit on their platform or does it sit with you? And that is why we've been kind of like languishing, if I may say the word, without upsetting any regulators in the room, in the sandbox because of that, right? The fear of... Um, by law, the Financial Services Act, by law, the control of these um, information, customer information. And so we've managed to migrate, um, or would I say graduate from the sandbox a lot earlier, in, in some instances. 
and actually started to commercialize. So right now, as we speak, I'm now um, running about piloting with five clients on a supply chain financing using a, a, a fintech platform with machine learning. Machine learning makes uh, regulators very nervous because they mm-hmm. fear that you know what happens, what goes in may not be what comes out. And that the machine learning itself, the machine itself becomes a black box. So that is the fear. They always question, is this auditable? So now what we're saying to the regulators, look, we have no choice. You know, trade has come down significantly. And the only way that we really want to try to push back the economy up is to facilitate trade. Malaysia's GDP fell minus 17% in the second quarter of this year. And that was that is worse than during the Asian financial crisis of minus 11%. So now with all these things that we're doing, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a rebound, particularly in our rubber gloves and our palm oil, you know, there's a, there's a rebound. But largely also the way we do things, uh, we, I can say in the last six months, we've cut um, physical invoice presentment, bills presentment by half. Those who were still doing it physically, yeah, so are now already uh, by half. Those larger corporates, um, you know, whom, whom we were talking about working with uh, previously on smart contracts, now say, we're doing this. Let's get this done. So I'm hopeful we're not quite there yet, but I'm hopeful in a year from now, if we're, if we're having this conversation again, I can tell you that, you know, our smart contracts are up and running, that we could use distributed ledger technology. The thing is, we're not, technology is not wanting it's there. We can plug in. It is whether or not both ourselves and our clients are willing to try something else and whether the regulators would also, you know, extend that leash a little bit to allow us to do things differently than how we used to do before. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rishi, I, you know, the sense of urgency, I, knowing you, you, you always have the sense of urgency. Um, I know that your uh, client base has uh, dramatically increased and the overall uh, payments, digital payments has increased. Do you see that continuing, uh, Rishi? Is is that something that just as Rajati has talked about, uh, you know, there is no other choice and, and the clients need to get back into business and are resorting to uh, the, the tools and the capabilities that you're providing. Is that happening in your retail customer base, but more importantly, in your uh, MSME market base? Is that something that you're you're uh, seeing and, and hope to continue uh, with the marketplace? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we see that during the COVID, uh, there was a lot of migration for people to move to local shops and local network, including digital tools, to start doing it for transaction purpose. And there was no choice, as Rajati also mentioned that people had, were compelled to move to a different alternate channel for doing business because the branches were not running, the ATMs were practically out of money. So from that point of view, once the start, customer started going to alternate channels, in urban we saw people moving to digital channels, in rural we saw people moving to merchant channels, and during that practice and people started to trust those channels more. The, the bigger issue with consumer moving to an alternate channel is the trust. One bad experience on a digital transactions and then no face-to-face interactions with a lot of these fintech companies uh, large, largely working through uh, some kind of a call center or some, some, some way through mobile applications. People are wary of doing transactions. But when people had no choice, they had to adopt to this system and they adopted quite well, both on the merchant side as well as on the uh, mobile side. So what I see is that there is a change of behavior and I believe anything which persists for more than six months or so, it, it, it converts into permanent change. Anything which is for a few months, people go back. Like we saw in demonetization, the digitization went up and for some people it again came down because the impact was only for two, three months. But in uh, COVID, it's already seven, eight months of uh, people adopting new technologies. So it's it's kind of enshrined in them in terms of looking at this alternate channel as a permanent channel. So I don't expect the consumer to go back. Obviously, there will be people who will who will feel that let's just go back to the old traditional way of doing business. But largely, I would say uh, the wave has already started. It's more of a permanent change, and people will move to this channel permanently. As far as the cons- MSMEs and SMEs are concerned, 
we provide uh, cash management services to a lot of NBFCs, MFIs, a lot of small and medium enterprises across the country because of our far reach across the country, almost 95% of the districts in the country having more than half a million points. We become a natural channel for a lot of people to collect cash. And rural, you understand, is a cash-based uh, business. So because of the pandemic, people were not able to move around their own employees and they were not able to collect money from the customer. Even customers were wary of meeting in groups and uh, giving out money. So what happened is that a lot of alternate channels uh, through merchant, people started to adopt that as one of the collection points. So we saw a big jump uh, post, uh, I would say, the moratorium, uh, which got ended in August, that people started paying and we saw a big jump on our cash management services. We actually grew to about 35, 40% more than pre-COVID levels as of October on the CMS uh, alone. So we see that once that has happened, it, it actually improves the efficiency for companies. They can reduce the number of people who go around and collect cash. They, they improve the efficiency in terms of collection of money on T plus one basis, they get the money and otherwise they have to wait for T plus two, T plus three. So a lot of improvement in terms of adoption because of uh, technologies and uh, local networks has happened. I don't see corporates or individuals going back to the old method of doing business. Uh, predominantly also from the fact that there's result in a lot of operational efficiencies for them and they can really scale. India is a big market. If you can really scale by variableizing the cost, I think that has been a big, uh, big, big, big change. Uh, I would say two big changes uh, when I look at this uh, post-COVID world. Variableization of cost, if you look at any fintech, any company, you hear from them about 30 to 40 percent cost reduction has happened in there. And secondly, virtualization. So variableization and virtualization are two big events which has happened. Even customers have adopted to it. Customers are also getting used to going to a different place to do transactions and different tools to do transactions. And that has actually reduced the cost and can help the companies to scale much faster and much bigger. So I think COVID for us has been beneficial. We have actually gained from COVID if I look if from a business point of view, if I look at it. But otherwise also going forward, I think both from a consumer as from a corporate or SME point of view, I think COVID has changed the behavior of a customer and the outlook of a customer to do business. And I think that would be, remain a more permanent change. And I don't see that going back anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, uh, Vishy, uh, if I can turn to you, you have uh, typically insurance has a large frontline team. Distribution models are uh, um, heavily uh, workforce based. Has the frontline adoption changed in, in, during this time? Have you been able to put in new innovations? Have customers changed their expectation of how they shop and, and procure uh, insurance products, or for that matter, how you service the the, uh, the individuals on their policies. Um, it, you know, when we look across uh, insurance uh, and the various uh, piece, it, normally uh, there's a massive, massive uh, frontline uh, team. Sometimes they're employees, sometimes they're third parties. Um, what's changed for you, and and have you been able to uh, get innovation into that team? That's a very interesting question, Sri. Reminds me of a phrase, uh, getting the elephant to dance. So we have a 15,000 employee uh, team of which uh, 13,000 are in the front line. Right? And uh, so they are away, away and uh, in their own beat. And we, are, we have a situation where we had a situation where 100% of our traditional sales done by these, uh, by these 13,000 people were face to face selling. Of course, uh, we are a leading player in uh, e-commerce and online selling. But in terms of premium, it's only about 5-6%, while in number of policies, it might be 15-18%. So how, how to transition from this face-to-face -face selling to home-to-home -home selling? Or as uh, somebody reminded me, uh, it's heart-to-heart -heart selling, Vishy. It's not home-to-home. -home. We are still selling an emotional product. It might be financial services, but it, but it involves deep emotion. So uh, I recall uh, on Friday, April the 3rd, uh, taking inspiration from uh, Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible. We said, uh, let's, let's, let's launch a Mission Possible, a Mission Possible 2020, 
where uh, let's try to at least be at 75% of last year's volumes. Because uh, when we launched in the first week of lockdown, we were down to only 20% of last year's volumes. So we said, let's try to come to that level. And uh, uh, the, the speed, the action, the agility that the teams did, uh, because nobody knew the way forward. Um, uh, you know, there were no consultants to help us out. Uh, and uh, so we just got together, got our eyes and ears close to the ground. Uh, and thanks to that, uh, we were able to actually uh, create a lot of sustainable, I would say, innovations. Time will tell. Uh, but to give you, an, uh, uh, give you a flavor on, on both the customer-facing innovation as well as back-end innovations, as far as customer-facing innovation is concerned, number one was hyper-personalization. So uh, never ask again uh, for a customer who visits our website. Uh, um, and uh, so, you know, you, si you simply continue where you left. Uh, segmented and personalized chase communication. Hyper-personalized notifications. This is the journey stage in which you left, whether it's a lead or an e-court or initiating payment. And uh, thanks to that, post-COVID, uh, from being number two, number three, we have actually become number one in India's online life insurance term market term marketplace, having a market share of nearly one third uh, in a 24 player market. The, the second big aspect was on uh, B2B or, uh, you know, how do we, how do we introduce innovation uh, to these large, uh, to this large dispersed sales force? Uh, we found that uh, the process of onboarding, which was heavily paper-based, um, we had some digitalization, but people, when they were face-to-face, -face, they had paper, they wanted it more convenient. Uh, rather than adopting digitalization full, full uh, in a, on a on a on a hundred percent basis, and just like uh, Rajati said, that is a very interesting journey. Uh, thankfully, the regulator is far more evolved here in India, uh, so we went completely digital. So we went paperless, uh, signatureless, and even personless in the back end. And so we were we are now able to issue policies within thirty minutes. All we move there. <laughs> of, of the, of the, of the <laughs> So the moment the customer says yes, everything from the KYC to the underwriting rules to the dedupe engines to the uh, uh, to the policy issuance uh, and the certificate of insurance being available to the customer saying your risk is covered happens within 30 minutes. So that delightful customer experience has motivated the seller who who at least felt that okay, this has resulted in some benefit for me in this whole effort. Uh, customer and recruitment webinars saw a 10x in terms of participation. So that was fantastic to engage with customers who are not coming to our branches anymore, to engage with agent probables, candidates who, who, who we were able to recruit through webinars. And on the back end, uh, we found that our inbound calls actually doubled uh, because our branch walk-ins actually came down by half. And when the inbound calls doubled and the call centers were shut, we couldn't operate with our call centers, right? Traditionally, what we had done is just increase the number of seats, double it. But this time, what we did was, because we didn't have that option, we said, everybody's working from home. Let's dish out this work to our mid-office teams sitting at their homes. So then mm -hmm. we were forced to have Uberized calling, work from home enabled, 100%. And actually our productivity, which was 50, 60, 80, about three months back has touched two pre-COVID levels of 100%. So input tracking, talk time, login hours, background noise reduction, uh, VOIP enabled uh, uh, calls to the agent, uh, to the call centers, uh, rather the call agents, mobile number, uh, we having control without actually having to sit and stare over somebody's shoulder. That was a big innovation for us. Uh, not only cut cost, but even created that kind of personalization. Because now, instead of having a rookie call center executive handle these calls and emails, by the way, we had experienced tenured on an average nine years, tenured employees handling this from their homes. So the level of personalization improved. Our net promoter score from negative in that touch point has moved to high double digits. So we were able to actually cut cost, improve customer service and crash TAT. And uh, lo and behold, we also found that we were able to generate referrals, word of mouth referrals for uh, a cross sell started coming in from this channel. And that was mm -hmm. amazing. It's also becoming a, uh, becoming a most loved revenue channel within the company now. So this, this whole philosophy change of moving from transactions to relationship uh, has really has really helped us, uh, not just in the front end, but even in the back end. So you really captured the emotional aspect, both from the customer side, but also your agents uh, to get them to be delighted through this whole process as well. So that's fantastic to hear. 
Rajiti, you wanted to make a comment. Uh, you were saying something earlier. Well, I was just extremely jealous. So <laughs> I was going to say that, you know, I want to move there too. Um, no, yeah, I, I think for us, it's really not technology. We, we're, we're ready. We're ready to run, you know, for, for us is uh, largely within the regulatory ambit of what we can and cannot do. Uh, particularly on the retail side. So, Richie, like for us, that, that has been our challenge. We cannot do remote KYC till this very day. We have to do face-to-face. -face. So that's a challenge for our retail and retail SME. But on our corporate side, you know, I'm also extremely encouraged that our clients are giving us the opportunity to, to experiment with stuff that we otherwise would never be able to get people to buy into these things. Yeah, and it's really, I mean, you have a huge market all of uh, we're in ASEAN and all of our ASEAN is not even like anywhere near India. Uh, so it's, it's challenging for us because we have to function differently in different markets and different levels of uh, regulatory readiness. So yeah, that's, it's, 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 it's still a challenge. Perhaps you should have a regulators share best practices. Who knows what? <laughs> I, I always Ooh. wish that they would, you know, this year, I really do. <laughs> Maybe we'll leave that for as a takeaway for the ET team to uh, to to do in the next round. Uh, but but Shiv, uh, we talk a lot about through this whole discussion the, the kind of the tenant is corporate culture within your own institution. Uh, maybe starting with with Shiv and then ask each of you to comment. Um, uh, uh, Shiv, then Rishi, then Rishi, and then lastly Rajati. Uh, Talk about how the corporate culture is changed during this uh, for your organization. Uh, clearly, the sense of urgency time has been fantastic in, in some ways, also, although the pandemic hasn't been great from an emotional and health perspective for all of us. It, um, it in some ways has driven innovation and digitalization across the firms. But Shiv, uh, what's what's changed uh, and especially what's changed uh, at your corporate center uh, uh, in London versus what's changed maybe in Singapore and the regions that you're operating from? Um, yeah, I think interesting, interesting uh, okay. questions here. On the corporate culture, you know, I will probably, I think we have all spoken <coughs> about um, the push and the momentum this, this pandemic has given to internal decision making on the, if the business case, I mean, the business case for digitalization innovation was always there in my view. Uh, it has just become more, uh, a necessity than uh, a nice to have for for growing revenues, but but the aspects of culture I want to focus on on more internal on on terms of people management in terms of how we redefine what we stand for how we redefine how we engage and treat each other I think um, it was a very chaotic initial couple of weeks I'm, I must I must admit because you know for a global organization where different countries are at different stages of lockdown. You have teams and clients in one country able to do something that teams and clients in other countries can't do because every country has a different uh, stage of lockdown. The need to communicate and over communicate and stay connected increased. I think the, the collaboration tools. So, so while initially it turned out being what we thought was a disadvantage, that the fact that we cannot meet in person, the fact that we cannot sit in the same office, walk into a meeting room, draw on a whiteboard, uh, and those things will probably damage some of the teamwork and the culture of collaboration. Um, as weeks passed, it actually turned out to be the other way around. The fact that you could virtually do this across time zones, across countries, made it more easier than less. Um, and the adoption of digital tools uh, for internal collaboration, I'm not talking about client engagement now, for internal collaboration across time zones, that increased a lot. The cultural awareness of different geographies, different countries improved. So, you could see when in March, um, mid-March, early April, when Asia was going into lockdown, Singapore was shut down. Um, the Western world seemed pretty immune. They're only hearing this as something in the news happening far away. Um, and they couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. Um, but then as as the, the pandemic moved westward, um, you know, and the, and, the, and, and the scales turned, these cultural sensitivities uh, heightened somewhat. I think, I think what was important for, for us as senior management and leaders, I'm sure all the panelists on, the, on this call would also have experienced the same thing. Um, the need to communicate that we're all in this together. 
this is not this is not something that's only impacting our bank or our industry it is impacting all our clients it's impacting whether you're a large customer or a small customer the feeling of um, being in this together and we have to work together to get out of it i think that transformed some of the cultural aspects uh, it also impacted i would i would say in our company from what i've seen the junior most colleagues from a cultural teamwork perspective a bit more adversely than the more experienced colleagues because um, you know a new joiner a fresh graduate or a post graduate who comes in from university his first six months or one year you know the 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 collaboration with seniors the ability to attend meetings with senior colleagues the ability to sit and discuss after a meeting or have informal networking teachings and and learn from the experience of seeing how seniors behave in certain situations that was missing so just imagine a fresh graduate has just joined uh, a large global organization and within one week everything is locked down and they have to now work from home so even before you know the the poor guy has completed his induction uh, everything is locked down so this need to significantly redefine what organizational culture meant how we look out for each other how teams work together uh and this culture of putting clients and putting colleagues ahead of uh, anything else i think i think that has been a very positive change um in fact i have got to meet uh i think got to at least virtually see and uh, look into you know people's studies and people's houses um see their family members see their kids run into run into their rooms when they're having zoom calls um i you know i've, I've never i've never seen family members and, and and spouses and children of so many of my employees and team members um uh, than i did during this last 6 7 months so so i think the culture in my view has um has contrary to what we thought initially that everybody working remotely not seeing each other might have a detrimental impact on organizational culture team building collaboration that has not panned out in reality it has it has gone the other way around um the sense of bonding and sense of togetherness and sense of a common purpose that we are all in this together has actually uh, improved uh, culture not just not just at us but within the organization but also in how we uh, engage and relate to clients our suppliers our stakeholder the external law firm the external country they're all in the same boat right um i think that has been a very positive change for for the, for the good and it will stay because um, i don't I'm not sure about the others on the panel i would assume that's the case but we firmly believe that some of the the changes in the workplace that have happened because of the covid are here to stay um even if there is a vaccine even if things go back to some sort of normalcy a year down the line um the flexibility that we will allow our employees to work from home um uh not not having everybody sit in a central office in prime location in the most expensive real estate in in, in the city is no longer a requirement we can have dispersed offices we don't have we don't need to have big pcp recovery sites anymore we realize now successfully for 8 months that everybody is drawing room or everybody is study is our is our backup site right um so so some of those things will change also from a risk management culture um might not be so relevant to people in uh, you know who have been in the retail banking space but uh, all of us at some stage i'm sure have worked in corporate banks post the financial crisis in 2008 2009 with all the problems with uh, libor scandals and fx fixing and all a lot of controls were put by banks in their dealing rooms and in their uh, fx trading rooms you know you can't take your mobile phones personal mobile phones into your dealing room you have to make sure that before you leave for lunch or coffee break your desk is completely clean there are no confidential papers lying around now suddenly how do you enforce all that when people are trading from homes all our fx dealers are trading from home so we could have situations where um you know uh, two people in the same house you know the husband and wife work for different organizations technically could be competitors and they're both working from home doing one is an fx trader one is a bond trader and they, how do you enforce client confidentiality they don't leave their screens open uh, with term sheets on that and some amount of risk consciousness you know trusting your employees to do the right thing without having to like she said you know stand over their shoulder and watch what they are doing you know some amount of it you could automate through through software that shows how long um an employee has spent on one screen versus another screen you know screens lock themselves they leave it open for too long and some of those tools we have been able to push down to people's laptops in their houses um but then we had to also significantly redefine the employee conduct risk culture 
when everybody is working from their homes and some of the things that regulators and our risk and conduct colleagues expect us to enforce um, in a physical office, uh, everybody's on one floor is different when everybody's working from home. So in, in that sense, I think there has been um, uh, a need to redefine not just how we interact with clients, digitization, how we interact with each other, but also what we mean and how we will measure uh, employee conduct and risk culture internally in the bank as well. Um, just checking on time. Thank you, Shiv. Uh, just checking on time. Uh, do, uh, one uh, maybe quick line from each of the other speakers, uh, the panelists, uh, on the culture piece uh, would be helpful. And then we'll close out with that. Um, I'm looking to the moderator to see if that's possible. Two minutes. Perfect. All right. Uh, um, um, Vishi, uh, sorry, uh, Rishi, if you can go first and then uh, then Vishi. Yeah, just to add, I think Shiv very uh, well covered uh, all the aspects. And I think in India or in organizations, the things were more or less the same. It was not drastically different. And we saw high level of commitment from employees. Uh, communication was probably the key to continue to build on the culture piece because culture takes a lot of time. And it took a big hit in the first few days when everybody went into huddle and uh, we were just communicating or maybe over communicating also just to keep the channels alive with the team and to make sure that there were a lot of anxieties around and the fear, I would say, because of the COVID, uh, what will happen. I think the cases have risen, but the fear has come down uh, in the recent past. So having said that, so communication was probably the key which was there. We saw a high level of commitment from employees uh, during that period, and it continues to be in that uh, frame. And the productivity actually uh, gained. Culture specifically from the purpose, which is there, the organization purpose, that was something which we kept on talking in every message of HR. And also every message in which I was present, we started to talk more on the emotional connect and the fact that we need to be very, very humble during this period. And we need to make sure that uh, the employee's uh, empathy piece is taken well care of. So that was one area I would say in all, the, all our communications, whether on paper or whether emails or Work on VCs, empathy was the key uh, key connect which we used in our culture uh, uh, significance and the purpose of the organization was uh, brought up again and again. I would say I agree with Shiv. Uh, I also saw a lot of houses, a lot of homes, a lot of families and we could see kids going around shouting, we, something being made up in the kitchen. So all, all of it, we welcomed it and I think uh, everybody imbibed on it and built up on that. So coming to now in terms of the situation where we are, I think uh, we believe that a hybrid kind of a situation would probably emerge. Uh, we would see some departments like technology or maybe some products or some back office continuing to do work from home. But like in our organization, more than 50% people have started to come back. And uh, we, we are having uh, people around and uh, especially at our senior levels, we, we need to be there uh, as leaders to be seen around and to pat the, pat the back of people when they perform well. So uh, I think at this situation right now, uh, the first six months was quite good. Uh, people uh, imbibed on different things and different culture. I think now we are coming back and hopefully uh, in the next few months, uh, as the vaccine comes up, uh, a hybrid culture would evolve and it will be on the leaders in the company to actually make sure that in the communications, they keep that around and they especially talk about it, especially to new employees who have joined. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Uh, Rishi, anything uh, else to add? Um, from, from I will be quick. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, this pandemic has actually resulted in top line growth for us. We've uh, increased uh, our market share. It's actually at a decade high and our profitability has gone up. If there is one word why we've been able to do this is because of culture. And if you do a double click on culture, three aspects. One, collaboration has gone to an all new high. When faced with adversity, I've observed in the last 20 years in our company, uh, we all get together, cutting all boundaries, cutting through boundaries and silos, and we unlock that opportunity, number one. And so you'll find teams such as Mission Possible coming up. You'll find teams such as Road Opening Party, which is an inspiration from uh, India's border security forces, uh, which uh, on the Himalayan range, uh, which go ahead of the troops to remove and clear the landslides and the snowfall uh, to allow the heavy uh, armory to follow. 
So we had these road opening parties formed by risk management teams, which are like resistors in a circuit board, actuaries, underwriters, and they did magic during that time. So collaboration. Second is speed. We actually uh, filed a COVID rider. Uh, we were the first within six weeks uh, and sent and approved and we started selling. So it was amazing to see in a matter of weeks and months, we were able to conceive, create a product, uh, which was the need of the times when reinsurers went cold on such, on such a product. And uh, processes, we took again inspiration from a hotel and said, well, you enter a hotel, you need a credit card, but you don't, you don't spend, you're not built for it. You only are charged for it later. So why can't we do a buy now, pay later, even for insurance policies? And we were the first company to launch that as well. So speed. And finally, innovation. Working with an ecosystem of startups, uh, creating Max Life Innovation Labs, working, start, working with 151 startups, including folks from London and Singapore, and then culling it down to six, seven uh, startups whom, whom we are mentoring and working with closely to solve some very persistent problems. So I think this, this cultural change is priceless, Sri, and uh, at least it's a, it's a very positive outcome of this current situation that we are in. Thank you, Vishy. Rajiti, you have the last, uh, although a few words, uh, conscious of time. Uh, anything else you'd like to add and then we'll close up? I have to unmute, <laughs> yes. Well, I just wanted to also say that culturally, um, um, echoing what Rishi said, but we must not forget our employees first because, you know, sometimes you go out and look at everything else and then you forget the very engine that actually needs to run your business. And I think for me, the focus was really at the point in time when we moved into, when we went into lockdown, was to enable our people to be able to not just work from home, but you know, we sometimes forget maybe their spouses too are affected and, you know, there could be a reduction in income and, and the family could be struggling. So, you know, we're looking into hardship allowances now and those, uh, you know, the more junior levels, they used to make money from overtime and then now they don't, they don't get that opportunity for OTs. So I, I just feel that, you know, in, in every, in, 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 in times like this, I am hopeful that you get the best out of, you, of, of people. And I'm seeing that um, here amongst my colleagues too, and certainly seeing, you know, from all my fellow panelists here. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, Rajati. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me extend my thanks to all of the panelists. Uh, a fantastic conversation. Uh, clearly the message is, uh, a, a very changed times uh, with uh, changed cultures, changed behaviors, uh, all for the positive uh, during a very tough and difficult time. But innovation is obviously here to stay and digitalization is here to stay. Um, and there's a lot to retain from um, uh, this crisis and, and leveraging that to continue to change the industry and the sector. So thank you all again. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to host all of you today. I look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.